thank you all for coming and thank you, Don, for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, section, uh, in this part two of your uh, second century and the Bible treatment. And tonight we're going to be looking at the exegesis of the Old Testament. Okay, so in a minute I'm going to put up, um, share a screen and with some uh, PowerPoints. And on them I've listed either some information or scripture passages. You may want to look at them or have, you know, just write them down if you have an interest in them. But I just wanted you to see what it is that I'm mentioning because some of this material, it's, it's from a long time ago, it's 19 centuries ago. Uh, some of it will be less familiar to us than things that have happened more recently. So I'm going to try to grab the screen, share the screen now. And, um, oops. Has that come up? Has the screen, has the, uh, it, it has shown up? Good. Okay. So then again, you see there the heading for the overall treatment, the second century in the Bible. This is the part two on the exegesis of the Old Testament. So I want to point out the setting. Okay. In the second century that we're looking at, the 100s AD, there was no New Testament yet, no t New Testament canon yet. Christian churches were relying on the words of Jesus passed down, the gospels had been written, the apostles' letters. They were being read in worship services. They were being copied and passed on. But the idea of an actual body of literature that would be ultimately and finally authoritative had not yet fully been accepted. It was still in process. So when second century Christians referred to the scriptures, what they were talking about was the Jewish scriptures in the Greek translation called as as your pastor, Dr. Springer, last week pointed out, called the Septuagint. Uh, Septuagint meaning basically 70, and the Roman numeral abbreviation for the, for the Septuagint is the LXX, which means 70. So then when the early church then talked about the scriptures and what Paul says, for example, in 1 Timothy 3, all scriptures inspired by God, he's not talking about Matthew and John. He's not talking about Romans and 1 Corinthians. He's talking about what we would now call the Old Testament. So then the, the Christians were looking to the scriptures themselves, the Septuagint, as they studied them. But the question was, how do we, how should they interpret and preach and exegete the scriptures? And that's our question tonight. Okay. So if we're clear on that, I'm going to go ahead then. This is, so, so again, I'd like to, to wrap this up. What will be the New Testament is being used, but it's not called the New Testament yet. It's in fact, it's only much later in the second century that people start talking about a new testament or a, an additional canon beyond the one of the Jewish scriptures. But then if this if these are the scriptures they are to use, how are they be, to be interpreted? Well, that takes us to the background then in Jesus' words. Now, to be sure, these passages from Matthew and Luke that I've here put on put on the PowerPoint, these passages are not yet accepted as canon, but they're part of what Jesus had said, part of what had been bandied about, part of what had been talked about, and certainly passed on, and this helped to shape how the early church in the second century looked at uh, the scriptures, which again were the Septuagint, the Greek version of the New Testament. And so I'd like to call your attention then to Matthew 16, 21. You remember that perhaps this passage, Christ had asked a few verses earlier, who do you say that I am? And Peter had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Christ had blessed him and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not yet flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. Okay. Now that was just a few verses earlier. And then you have in chapter 16, 21, when, when Jesus speaks and Peter responds, and Peter responds, no, this will never be near you. And Jesus ends up telling Peter, get behind me, Satan. This is what Jesus had said. So after, after Peter's confession, beginning in verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem 
and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Notice it says there he must be killed and on the third day be raised. What kind of must are we talking about there? Is it just, well, that's the way it's going to work out? Or is there something more? Did Jesus anticipate here just, well, the way, the way things are happening, this is likely to be the case. Or did he see something more to it that it was necessary in order to fulfill the Old Testament? Well, in any event, the disciples didn't clue into this. They didn't understand it, as we know from our study of the scriptures and other places. Eventually, Christ was crucified. And then you have the story of his resurrection in Luke. And you know, the, you remember perhaps the story about uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus who are wandering along there and they're confused. They don't know what's going on. Uh, they and, and Jesus walks up to them. They don't recognize who he is. And he says, well, what's bothering you? Basically, what's bothering you guys? They said, what, are you a stranger? Don't you know what's happened? And so they talk about how this one whom they thought would be the Messiah ends up being betrayed and killed and destroyed and then they said now some of some of our colleagues say that he came back from the dead and then it says in verse 24 Matthew, Luke 24 some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they didn't see him then Jesus responds verse 25 then he said to them oh how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe notice what he says all that the prophets have declared Verse 26, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. This gives us an indication what that must in Matthew 16 was about, because he said it was necessary for the Messiah, the Christ, for himself, to be crucified and resurrected to fulfill what was written in all the scriptures. He specifically mentions Moses and all the prophets. And then you go a little bit further in Luke 24, again, the chapter of the, uh, of the resurrection. Luke 24, verse 44, by then, these two people have hustled back to Jerusalem to say what they've seen. Jesus appears to all the disciples. Verse 44, he, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then verse 45, then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. What Christ tells the disciples is that everything in, the, in what we call the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, is fulfilled in what happened with him. Notice that he, he's referred to Moses and the prophets in Luke 24, the earlier passage. That's a general reference to what the Jewish scriptures were. The more complete term is used in verse, verse 44, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, meaning the writings. That's the total package of what you have in the Jewish scriptures, how they break it down, the way we would talk about the gospels and the letters in the book of Revelation. The law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, that's the package. And according to what Christ said to them and what ended up shaping their thought is that all of this was fulfilled in him. Now notice, though they were all Jews, none of them clued into any of this. They had been nurtured in and taught the Jewish scriptures in the synagogues all their life. They spent three years with Jesus and he still missed all of this. <coughs> okay, so that takes us then to what became startling for them and shaping for the second century church. So what Jesus has said and what the early church is understanding is all the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, all of it, all the, all the Jewish scriptures were fulfilled in what Jesus Christ did in, in his life, death, and resurrection. He's not just an interesting afterthought. He's not just, in quotes, a fulfillment. 
He is what it was all about. So then all those scriptures, rightly understood, point to Jesus, the Messiah, and what he did, suffered and accomplished. Okay? Now that's the way in which Christ presented it. So we have it in the New Testament that's now we have now accepted. But the way in which it was taught to the disciples, the disciples then teach others after them. And so they pass on this message of who Jesus Christ was. And if you look at the sermons in, in the book of Acts, Peter appeals to the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Paul appeals to the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. It just comes up over and over again. If you look at the book of Matthew written after this, Matthew is at pains in writing to a Jewish audience to point out how this was fulfilled and that was fulfilled and this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But notice clearly, this was not how most of the Jewish people at the time understood their scriptures. The disciples didn't get it until Christ made it ultimately clear to them. So then, we end up with then conflicting claims to the Septuagint. Now, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this because our situation is so different than it was in the second century. Right now, Christianity has some billion adherents around the world. Uh, if, you, if you lump together the Protestants and Roman Catholics and the Orthodox and the Pentecostals, uh, there's over a billion of us who pr profess Christianity. That's a sixth of the world's population. Last year, my wife was engaged in preparing for uh, a presentation for a Bible study group, and she was doing something on the various world religions that have uh, that that uh, that are currently to be found in the world. And what she discovered was the total percentage of the Ju of those who profess Judaism, of those who are Jews and practice the faith, is two percent of the entire population. Certainly, Christians hugely outnumber. Jewish people in the present day. Christians have historically had much more influence over the last many centuries than Jewish people have. Forgetting all the horrors and, and, and the problems with regard to the Holocaust and the awful things that took place during the, during the Second World War, it's just the situation that, that there's been a preponderance of Christian influence. But in the second century, that was not the case. In the synagogues around, scattered around the Roman Empire, what's called the diaspora, where various Jewish people had, had moved after the exiles, where they were sent into Assyria or then certainly into Babylonia. Uh, when, the, when it became possible for the Jewish people to return under Cyrus, um, only 15% of the people who'd gone into exile came back. The rest continued to stay in Babylon or elsewhere. And around the Jewish empire and into the Persian empire to the east, uh, many Jews had, had spread out. They lived largely to themselves because they continued to honor the requirement for circumcision and Sabbath observance uh, and eating kosher and all that sort of thing. They, they didn't necessarily continue to speak Hebrew all that much, so they relied on the common language of the time, Greek, or if it was in our day, it'd be English, but back then it was common Greek. But what you had then were these groups called synagogues, just means a gathering together place, where Jews would come together to study the, the, their scriptures and to be exhorted to live faithfully, to, stay, to live faithful to Yahweh, to hold on to their practices, whatever. These synagogues had long been established. There were established, wealthy, very influential Jewish communities scattered throughout the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And the Christian movement was pretty small by comparison. In any event, you recall what Paul said about what he did with his missionary endeavors, and evidently others did this as well. Christian proclamation would go out to what would be hopefully a receptive audience among Jews because their own scriptures were being fulfilled. Christian proclamation began then in the Jewish synagogues scattered around the Roman Empire. Same thing in Persian Empire, but let's stick with the Roman Empire, which uh, is our focus for this, for this stuff that we're doing tonight. They would go there. And the pattern in a Jewish synagogue at the time was that after the preliminaries were done, a passage of scripture would be read, and then it would be something like, does anyone have a word? Or who would like to speak to this? That's how Jesus ended up speaking to Isaiah 61 
uh, in Luke 4 when he began his ministry in Capernaum. Well, Paul jumped at the chance. Yes, I'd like to say a word, and then he would preach Christ from the Jewish scriptures. Now, most of the time when people had not encountered him before, this was new to them, but he talks about the fulfillment of the Messiah. He talks about what took place and how these promises were surprisingly fulfilled in the work and in, in, in the life, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension. So what ended up happening is that in those synagogues, some of the Jewish people believed and embraced Jesus Christ as the fulfillment. They ended up understanding and embracing what he was saying. It's a fulfillment of what their scriptures had promised. But some Jews didn't. Probably the majority did not. But those Christian Jews, Christianized Jews, if you will, Christian Jews, would continue to come to the synagogue for a while. Some of the what were called God-fearers who hung around the synagogues also came to believe. Now, what was a God-fearer? A God-fearer was a Gentile. We hear about a Roman centurion in the New Testament and others as well. But these were Gentiles who hung around the synagogues. They liked the idea of monotheism. They liked the moral emphasis. They found it attractive and compelling as a way to live. But eating kosher wasn't great and circumcision, thank you, no. So these were people who hung around the edges of the, uh, of the Jewish community. They, they came to, a, to the synagogue as much as they could to hear further about what it was that Jews believed. Well, many of them came to believe in Jesus as the fulfillment of what they had heard from the Jewish scriptures as Paul and others proclaimed Christ out of the Jewish scriptures. But with that, you ended up with a rift developing in these synagogues. Sometimes they're right away a split. Sometimes they're just tension. Eventually, in due course, a church is set up and a synagogue still continues. So with all of that, edginess developed between the synagogues and the emerging churches because both were claiming to be the ones who followed the Jewish scriptures faithfully. Notice that both of them were claiming to be the ones who really followed those Jewish scriptures. And during the second century, this edginess led to rivalry as to which group, Jews or Christians, were the true descendants of Abraham. Paul had already dealt with this in Romans 11. I'll just point you there in case you're interested in looking at it, where he said that we as Gentiles are the wild olive branch who've been grafted onto the genuine olive branch of the Jews in Romans 11. In Galatians 3 and 4, though, he ends up saying that, no, though, that those who are the children of promise, that is, those who believe, are the genuine descendants of Abraham. So basically, the question is, who gets to claim these scriptures and who gets to claim to be the, the descendants of Abraham. And that was a big deal in the old Roman, in the ancient Roman Empire, because the descendants of Abraham had special privileges in the Roman Empire. And for the Jews to claim those was upsetting to the Jews. I mean, for Christians to claim those privileges was at least confusing to the Romans and also to the Jews. That's a different question. We'll have to leave it to the side. But it ended up during the second century and beyond it in the third and fourth centuries, Christians appealed to the Septuagint and its particular wording so often and so effectively that Jews in the diaspora turned away from the Septuagint to other Greek translations of their scriptures. Two were produced in the second century, one by Aquila of Sinope, Sinope and the other one by Theodosian. And in the third century, another, another Jew named Synechus uh, also produced a translation. Why did they do that? Well, because the particular wordings of the Septuagint were seized on by Christians. For example, in Isaiah 7, 14, the Hebrew says, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son. The Septuagint says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, the Jews had long since claimed that the Septuagint was an inspired translation. But when that happened, and then the way in which Isaiah 53 was appealed to, and the wordings that were used, uh, and, and the way in which New Testament writings ended up appealing in due course to the Septuagint word, words themselves, Jews became largely uncomfortable with it and ended up not using the Septuagint anymore uh, in their synagogues, but relying on, on these other trans Greek translations produced in the second or third century. So that, so that something real is going on and the Christians are being, are very effectively appealing to the Old Testament. Whoops, I went too fast. 
so then let's turn more specifically now to the second century Christian exegesis of, I'll put the Old Testament there, you know what I mean, it's the Septuagint, it's the Jewish scriptures. First person to mention, I want to mention is a man named Justin Martyr. He died around the year 165. He's called Martyr because he was martyred. We have the story of his martyrdom. It's really quite a, a, a moving piece as to what happened to him and how he was tried and what how he responded and so on. Excuse me. He was, he grew up as a Samaritan, um, became interested in trying to learn how be, he, he grew up as a Samaritan, so in the land of Palestine, but not among Jewish people. Uh, he was interested in how, how to live a better life, a more responsible life. He was drawn toward philosophy as perhaps giving him a better understanding. Eventually, Plato was attractive to him, but ultimately he became converted to Christianity through the work through the influence of, a, of an elderly person who wasn't a particular philosopher, but who knew the scriptures well. He became a convert, a very influential uh, teacher and writer then. He had several people who, who worked with him or lived with him, who he taught kind of like in the old pattern of having disciples with you. He became a writer who produced two apologies, uh, the first and second apology. The first one for sure, the second one we're not sure if it wrote him. Now, let, let me clarify something on that, because this is not a term we, ought, we use all that much. Uh, the, the Greek word apologeo means I offer a defense. It doesn't mean I'm sorry. So two apologies for Christianity doesn't mean I'm sorry I'm a Christian. Just the opposite. Uh, to offer an, a, an apologetic, to offer an apology for Christianity was to defend it against its opponents. And so he wrote a couple of apologies. So he's a very gifted uh, thinker, and he ends up offering... Uh, uh, defenses of Christianity against the, the calumnies, the criticisms of Jews, and also of Romans, uh, the Roman Empire. The other work that he's noted for is called Dialogue with Trifle. Uh, this was a respectful engagement with a well-instructed Jewish scholar, whether this was an actual, actual dialogue or something he dreamed up as a, uh, as a way of making his points, uh, we don't know. But whatever it is, it's a very respectful engagement. The important point of that is that by this time, there was a lot of hostile reaction between Jews and Christians. Uh, the first persecutions of Christians were at the hands of Jews. There was a lot of edginess and hostility, and it was returned back by some early writers as well. And if we can keep the, the horrors of the Second World War out of, uh, out of our thoughts, uh, we can recognize that back then there was tension between the two. Justin Martyr doesn't engage in that. It's a respectful engagement in which Trifle presents his understanding of the Jewish scriptures, but then Justin Martyr presents his. And he claims vigorously that the Jewish scriptures find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and not, not surprisingly, his side ends up winning the argument. Okay? Oops. Now, how did he approach it, and what was common in the second century then? First of all, Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It's easy. Isaiah 53, he, that he shall bear, you know, he, he was crucified for us, he bore our sins and all that sort of thing. So the, a lot of things about where he would be, for, where he would be born, many, many things in the, in the Old Testament, in what we would call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, were pointed to by, by uh, Justin Martyr and others in the second century as a fulfillment of prophecy. We still do that kind of thing in the present day. But there's something else that was done then, and it's still done today. They talked about what are called types. You've heard that perhaps. Have you heard of typology before? In any event, the word type means a foreshadowing, Some, that something would happen early on that anticipates what, what will be ultimately coming in fulfillment. So a, a type uh, point, points forward to its antitype. Now, when this thing takes place, whatever this type is, it's complete in itself. It's not like, oh, this is pointing to something in the future. This is something that people would recognize, whether it's a person or an individual or an event. But what is one of the ways of understanding the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish scriptures that, that Christians pointed to, is that the things in the Old Testament pointed forward to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now, let me just point out three uh yeah three different clusters of these in john 1 29 where the where john the baptist points to jesus and said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world well we love that passage 
But what John is doing is pointing to the Lamb of God on the Day of Atonement that carried away the sins of the people of Israel. So on the Day of Atonement, he's saying that what was in the Old Testament is fulfilled in this one. It was the type, Christ is a fulfillment. Christ himself says in John 3, verses 14 and 15, uh, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, pointing to the cross. Well, what Christ says is what took place with Moses when the people had been bitten by the serpents and the way in which they were supposed to be healed would be to look at this brass, brass serpent on a pole. Christ said, that is a foreshadowing of me. And you know, to use this term, it's a type of what would be fulfilled on the cross in Christ. And Paul then in Romans 5 and again in 1 Corinthians 15 makes a big deal of in Adam, in Christ, in Romans 5, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Through one man's sin, many became sinners. Through another, through one man's righteousness, many become righteous. And then Roman, 1 Corinthians 15, in the contrast of Adam and Christ again. So here you have specific indicators of an Old Testament actuality, Adam, sin, and Christ as the fulfillment or the of, of that type, the, the contrast. <coughs> Okay, now, let me just toss this out to you to think about. Are these specifically mentioned types the only ones possible? Or is it an invitation to explore the Jewish scriptures to find more? We might think, being very, con if we're very conservative, oh, well, sola scriptura, if it's not explicitly stated, we shouldn't say it. The early church thought, wait a minute, we, we shouldn't suggest there are other types and, and try, to, try, try to find them. Uh, in the second century church said, wait a minute, the Jewish scriptures are a big book. There's lots going on. And Christ said, all that is written in the law of Moses and the prophets and, and the writings, the Psalms have to be fulfilled in me. So notice what both of these, fulfillment of prophecy and the, and the types, according to Christian exegesis, that is the way the Jewish scriptures have to be interpreted. And Justin Martyr, the one we just referred to, made much of both of these. He talked about fulfillment of prophecy, but he also talked about types. Not just Adam and Christ, but let me toss one out to you. He pointed out, Dr. Springer will know this too from, from our mutual work in Irenaeus, who does it as well. He pointed out the type between Eve and Mary. Through Eve, sin came into the world. Through Mary, salvation comes into the world. Now, the salvation through Christ. But connecting these Old Testament types with the way in which they're fulfilled the, the, and the two women so justin martyr ends up making much of both of these but that takes us then to the person who is especially noted for his old testament proclamation melito of sardis now melito died around 190 so near the end of this of the second century he carries these types much further as i'll make clear in reading in just a few minutes because i want to read you some passages from him now what do we know about sardis it was a major cultural center of ancient Asia Minor. It was a, it had a large and long established Jewish population. So the synagogue there was not a minor place. It was a major situation and the Jews were well established. They were deeply involved in the economy and well respected in the city. The church in Sardis is addressed in, in one of the seven letters of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter three, verses one to six. So the church has been around for a while, established during the apostles time, okay? Who was Melito? Melito was himself Jewish. Evidently, he'd been kicked out of his family for embracing Christianity. And some of his words are a little edgy toward the Jewish community that kicked him out, even though he says, what I believe is what you should believe because it's a fulfillment of what you say you believe. In any event, there's some edginess on his part, no question. But he penned several apologies, again, defenses of the Christian faith, as I mentioned. He penned several doctrinal treatises. Regrettably, all of them are lost. Except in the last century, this this one was called On Pasha. I'll hold that up when I when I stop sharing the screen. This man, the manuscript was discovered sometime in the early 1900s and published in 1940. Now that's extraordinary. When we think back to the early church, we have lots of material that's come down to us in many, many copies, many, many manuscripts. And so we've, we've had for centuries Eusebius's church history. 
For centuries, we've had Irenaeuses against heresies. For centuries, we've had sermons and writings from all kinds of people. But, but there are a lot of works that, for one reason or another, I, uh, have not been kept or they've been lost or they've not been found. And many works that were referred to in the ancient church um, just seem to have been lost, except every once in a while. It happened twice, at least, in the, in, uh, the 20th century. An old Christian manuscript, long thought lost, is found in a monastery somewhere in the Middle East or in Armenia or something. Um, and someone reads to it and recognizes this must be. And sure enough, as they study it, it turns out that this is the work long thought lost, but still has existed in some copy, in some manuscript, in some library, in some monastery, somewhere. In any event, this work on Pasha is one of them. <coughs> on Pasha means on the Passover. It's a term, it was a term used in the early church and still today in Eastern Orthodox Christianity for the three day period, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and, Sun, and Easter Sunday, okay? So that on Pasha is a treatment, uh, a sermon on the work of Christ is suffering, death, resurrection. The sermon was preached between 160 and 170. They figured that out, those who've been able to study it. And again, it was published in uh, 1940. It points out many, many ways the Old Testament passages or persons are fulfilled in or point to Christ. Um, and it, 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 it carries it way beyond the, the ones I listed just a few moments ago. It appears in 105 strophes, or might call them stanzas. The startling thing is the sermon is written in poetry. Now, I was impressed last week with your pastor's ability to express himself very articulately and very clearly and make himself understood very well. I have never heard a sermon preached in poetry. This is the way he preached. I'm, I'm still boggled in my mind by it. In any event, on Pasha was the culmination of the high point of second century exegesis of the Old Testament. What I'd like to do now, just before we turn it open to questions, is read you a few, not all 105 strophes or stanzas, but a few of the, uh, some of the strophes, just to give you a flavor for what this is like. And I'll stop sharing the screen. Let me get rid of that. I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll hold up the book. It's, I, I think, I hope it's not in reverse there. It's called On Pasha Melito of Sardis. Uh, one of my friends who's an Orthodox theologian, teaches at St. Vladimir's Seminary, when he and I got to talking about Melito, he said, isn't he a genius? Uh, the way in which he deals with any of it. So he starts out, and then I'll just read you selected portions of, 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 of this sermon. It starts out, the scripture of the Exodus of the Hebrews has been read. So it's that's the pat, uh, passage scripture. And the words of the mystery have been declared, how the sheep was sacrificed, and how the people were saved, and how Pharaoh was flogged by the mystery. Therefore, well beloved, understand how the mystery of the Pasha is both new and old, eternal and provisional, perishable and imperishable, mortal and immortal. It is old with respect to the law, new with respect to the word, provisional with respect to the type, yet everlasting through grace. It is perishable because of the slaughter of the sheep, imperishable because of the life of the Lord. It is mortal because of the burial in the ground, immortal because of the resurrection of the dead. For there was once a type, but now the reality has appeared. So the slaughter of the sheep and the sacrificial procession of the blood and the writing of the law encompass Christ, on whose account everything in the previous law took place, though better in the new dispensation. For he was born a son and led as a lamb and slaughtered as a sheep and buried as a man and rose from the dead as God, being God by his nature and man. Um, now I'll jump ahead to another section. Remember that the angel ends up turning away from, from the people of Israel because of the blood over the doorposts. And so Melito addresses the angel. Tell me, angel, what turned you away? The slaughter of the sheep? 
or the life of the Lord? The death of the sheep or the type of the Lord? The blood of the sheep or the spirit of the Lord? It is clear that you turned away seeing the mystery of the Lord in the sheep and the life of the Lord in the slaughter of the sheep and the type of the Lord in the death of the sheep. This is what occurs in the case of a first draft. It's not a finished work, but exists so that through the model, that which is to be seen can be seen. Therefore, a preliminary sketch is made of what is to be from wax or from clay or from wood, so that what will come about taller in height can be seen through the small and provisional sketch. See what he's saying about the Old Testament? All of this is kind of preliminary. It's setting it up, but it's fulfilled in Christ. And then he goes on. Um, Thus the mystery of the Lord prefigured from of old through the vision of a type is today fulfilled and has found faith, even though people think it's something new. For the mystery of the Lord is both new and old, old with respect to the law, but new with respect to grace. But if you scrutinize the type through its outcome, you will discern him. Thus, if you see, wish to see the mystery of the Lord, look at Abel, who was likewise slain, at Isaac, who was likewise tied up, at Joseph, who was likewise traded, at Moses, who was likewise exposed, at David, who was likewise hunted down, at the prophets, who likewise suffer for the sake of Christ. This is the one made flesh in a virgin, who was hanged on a tree, who was buried in the earth, who was raised from the dead, who was exalted to the heights of heaven. This is the lamb slain. This is the speechless lamb. This is the one born of Mary, the fair you. This is the one taken from the flock and led to slaughter, who rose from the dead and resurrected humankind from the grave below. And two more sections. Brace yourself. You're going to hear something you've never heard before. He who hung the earth is hanging. He who fixed the heavens in place has been fixed in place. He who laid the foundations of the universe has been laid on a tree. The master has been profaned. God has been murdered. The king of Israel has been destroyed by an Israelite right here. He has no question that Jesus is the son of God. He's genuinely human. God, he says, has been murdered. And then finally, we can read more, but give some time for questions. It is I, says the Christ, I am he who destroys death and triumphs over the enemy and crushes Hades and binds the strong man and bears humanity off to the heavenly heights. It is I, says the Christ. So come all families of people adulterated with sin and receive the forgiveness of sins. For I am your freedom. I am the Passover of salvation. I am the lamb slaughtered for you. I am your ransom. I am your life. I am your light. I am your salvation. I am your resurrection. I am your king. He it is who made the heaven and the earth and formed humanity in the beginning, who was, proclaimed, who was proclaimed through the law and the prophets, who took flesh from a virgin. He was hung on a tree. He was buried in earth, who was raised from the dead and ascended to the heights of heaven, who sit the, at the right hand of the Father, who has the power to save all things, through whom the Father re acted from the beginning and forever. This is the Alpha, Alpha and Omega. This is the beginning and the end the ineffable beginning and the incomprehensible end. This is the Christ. This is the King. This is Jesus. This is the commander. This is the Lord. This is he who rose from the dead. This is he who sits at the right hand of the Father. He bears the Father and is born by him. To him be the glory and the might forever. Amen. That is second century preaching of the Old Testament.